Hey guys, and welcome to the Working Money Channel. So to give you some historical perspective of the printing of money, the beer flu cost $5.2 trillion. World War II cost $4.7 trillion in today's dollars. And since the beer flu, a total of $13 trillion, guys, was printed. Uh, 5.2 for the beer flu, and then another 4.5 for quantitative easing, plus $3 trillion for infrastructure. In its first 200 years, the U.S. printed $1 trillion. So to give you guys some perspective, Balaji here on Twitter also posting this uh, this video from Alan Greenspan back in 2011. Former Federal Reserve Chairman, listen to this. Are U.S. Treasury bonds still safe to invest in? Very much so. I think there's a... This is not an issue of credit rating. The United States can pay any debt it has because we can always print money to do that. So there is zero probability of the full... <laughs> and all these just print money. The best is this guy's expression here. We can always print money to do that. Mm, yeah, but isn't that such a good idea? This is where we're finding ourselves, though, again today. And let me remind you guys, this was 2011. So this was right after the financial crisis of 2008. Uh, you know, the downward market, 2008, 2009. And by 2010, 2011, the market started to recuperate. Gold Telegraph here also posting this for the first time in decades. The U.S. Treasury is set to initiate a buyback of U.S. government debt in 2024. This coincides with an increasing global trend of more and more countries looking to conduct trade in their local currencies and accumulate gold reserves. So all this to say that the world is changing very quickly uh, and the macroeconomic factors are really kind of pushing this move for countries, countries other than the United States to start using their own currencies and the technologies there to do it, start using their own currencies for trade. The need for the U.S. dollar uh, as a world reserve currency is, uh, you know, kind of an antiquated concept now when you bring in, uh, you know, technology like DLT, leveraging RippleNet, utilizing XRP as that liquidity provider. It's interesting, too, because there has been a bit of a sea change with regards to political figures, I think. And, uh, you know, I don't think anybody really wants to be on the wrong side of history. This one from Robert F. Kennedy Jr. OK, he's thrown his hat in the ring to become the Democratic candidate for the 2024 elections. Cryptocurrency led by Bitcoin, along with other crypto technologies are a major innovation engine. It is a mistake for the U.S. government to hobble the industry and drive innovation elsewhere. Biden's proposed 30% tax on cryptocurrency mining is a bad idea. Yes, energy use is a concern, but Bitcoin mining uses about the same as video games and no one is calling for a ban on those. The environmental argument is a speculative pretext to surpass anything that threatens elite power structures. Bitcoin, for example, he uses that uh, as one example there. Some advocate tight control of cryptocurrencies to prevent their use by criminals, but it isn't just criminals who want privacy. So do descendants and ordinary citizens. Governments harass their enemies and crush dissent by controlling bank accounts and payment platforms. Until we restore trust in government, a distant prospect, we need cash and crypto to ensure our freedom. Just as a biodiverse ecosystem is a resilient ecosystem, so too will our economy be more resilient if it has a diverse ecology of cryptocurrencies, not just a single centrally controlled one. We are seeing today how fragile our over-centralized system really is. So uh, a bit of an out-of-the-box concept here, uh, at least for a traditional politician. It is going to be interesting how this shapes up, but, uh, you know, if you got the last name Kennedy, I would be worried. Just saying. BNP Paribas China is to launch the digital yuan CBDC wallet. Now, guys, you know BNP Paribas is a Ripple partner, but their Chinese arm has partnered with the Bank of China to launch a digital yuan wallet to support its corporate clients for both offline and online payments. China's central bank digital currency is referred to as the ECNY. Uh, only a few major banks, including the four large state-owned banks, are directly connected to the main CBDC network, so the access of of CBDCs to all other banks must work through these institutions. Uh, and now BNP Paribas is connected to this. Uh, the wallet is going to support supply chain finance applications and payments for utility companies. Here's a quote, guys. The collaboration can supplement the bank's offline payment collection capabilities and further optimize our clients' account structures. This coming from CJ Lei, BNP Paribas, China's CEO. One of the more significant aspects of the potential of the use for the wallet is the Embridge project, a cross-border CBDC platform developed by the Central Bank of China, Hong Kong, Thailand, and the UAE in association with the BIS. So we know countries like Thailand, for example, is uh, also favorable to Ripple. We know the BIS on board with distributed ledger technology. 
also has connections, ties to Ripple. Unlike many other platforms that were just experiments, in the case of Embridge, the organizations are working towards production. So an interesting concept here, it's looking as though more and more likely we're going to see XRP running through China at some point in the game. We've been hearing about all kinds of Ripple connected banks associated with China, forming partnerships and, uh, you know, starting to do business in the country. Here's some more news, guys, from XRP Crypto Wolf Ripple partner Flare API portal introduces APIs on Google Cloud. So that's interesting. Flare FLR, the EVM based layer one blockchain and ecosystem of Web3 infrastructure applications, advances its accessibility with the launch of a dedicated page for APIs on the Google Cloud Marketplace. Here's the official statement, guys, from Flare. Flare has integrated its API portal on Google Cloud Marketplace, launching some of the first blockchain APIs on the platform. Developers can use the marketplace to easily access nodes of the top blockchains, including BTC, ETH, BNB, XRP, and FLR. So boom, a new integration here with Flare uh, and Google Cloud. This is going to bode well for more crypto utility in general. Uh, with its release, Web3 developers can now access the blockchain of Flare, FLR, and all the networks connected to its proprietary data acquisition protocols. Namely, devs can work on APIs for Algorand, uh, BNB Smart Chain, uh, Bitcoin, Dogecoin, Ethereum, Flare, FLR, natively Litecoin, Songbird, and XRP. Why is this good, we ask? Well, Josh Edwards here, uh, the VP of engineering said, greater availability of leading blockchain APIs on such platforms like the Google Cloud, which is a popular one, reduces the barriers to Web3 participation. So, you know, they're trying to look for ways to really onboard people. And, uh, you know, if you go to a mainstream option like the Google Cloud, uh, it's going to be a lot easier. It makes it easier for developers to experiment with blockchain technology and its many use cases without being burdened by onerous hardware costs and ongoing maintenance. So there's another uh, benefit to that. It also opens up the possibility for larger organizations and partners to experiment with safe, secure, and an approved set of Web3 APIs. So that's big guys. Flare integrating their API portals with Google Cloud. Wanted to thank XRP Crypto Wolf just for bringing that to our attention. Brad Garling has too also wanted us to know that he is heading to Dubai FinTech Summit next week. He's going to be talking about all things crypto utility and what's needed first and foremost, a regulator that's actually providing clarity. So a uh, bit of a dig there at the uh, at the SEC. But of course, in Dubai, uh, in the Middle East, they do already have a lot of clarity and Ripple uh, has been making tremendous headway in the Middle East for, uh, you know, crypto adoption, Ripple net adoption, the utilization of XRP slowly but surely. Uh, we know we're going to see this permeate more countries worldwide. Uh, so Dubai FinTech Week, wonder if we're going to hear anything interesting from that. Anthony Welfare here also on Twitter posting this. Ripple was ranked number one in an established leader for central bank digital currencies from 15 vendors. This was a report from Juniper Research and uh, he posted some of the screen grabs here, the competitive leaderboard. Uh, and here the key finding, Ripple was ranked number one and an established leader for central bank digital currencies for several reasons. Its existing success with RippleNet and the technological capabilities within the space and its existing deployment and growth within the emerging space. So Ripple just kind of knocking it out of the park, uh, obviously with regards to central bank digital currencies. I, I think it was one of the very first cryptocurrency related companies to really engage with central bank digital currencies. Obviously there was the potential there, obviously, you know, since they had all those partnerships with the central banks, it only made sense that Ripple was the one to develop CBDCs. And so here we're seeing it. They are ranked number one. I'm not sure if there's too much more competition there. Nevertheless, uh, great to see that that is in fact the case. And I will leave the uh, the Juniper Research paper up here uh, in the linked in the description of the video if you guys are interested in reading further. Moving along though, guys, I wanted to mention this, how the link system through Volente Technologies has been performing since its implementation. And get this, it has settled over $115 trillion dollars in Canada alone, listen to this. For any uh, time critical, uh, typically high value uh, payments uh, in Canada. So whether that's uh, obviously major me uh, mergers and acquisitions uh, or uh, something like uh, parents uh, providing money to their children for a down payment on a house, uh, Lynx is really there to support uh, their needs for uh, finality and immediate uh, payment settlement. And really pleased that following the implementation of release one in August of 2021, uh, it's been working exceptionally well. Uh, it is, as we say, the high value system. Uh, so over the first year, it's settled $115 trillion uh, and 12 million uh, payments. So on, on a daily average, that's about 50,000 uh, payment transactions uh, a day. Uh, and about $460 billion uh, a day. So obviously um, 
spent a lot of time defining that strategy and the process for implementing the two releases. That's worked exceptionally well and obviously very proud uh, coming out from release two. Um, obviously from a Canadian perspective, uh, it's critical in terms of developing and enabling uh, the ISO 20022 message set, uh, not only for Canada, but obviously from a global community perspective, uh, working in lockstep uh, with SWIFT on the cross-border space to ensure that uh, uh, the Canadian community uh, maintains that level of interoperability uh, with other jurisdictions, obviously, that are moving forward or have moved forward uh, with the implementation of ISO 20022. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Well, that's a really positive note. So did you hear that? $115 trillion, I think it broke down to $4.6 billion per day running through links uh, which is running on Valente Technologies. Now, I brought this up, Canadian Payment Modernization. This has been in the works since 2022, but that was a fairly recent interview. Canadian Payment Modernization is in full swing. Uh, here we have Lynx is the next generation for high value wire payment processing. You talked a little bit about the ISO 20022 integration. Uh, it's not uh, just national payment systems that are changing. Canada has also put itself on the open banking map to developing two API gateways and making a sandbox available. Uh, the shift to open banking and the rise to cloud are forcing banks to modernize their payment infrastructures or risk falling behind. So again, guys, this is uh, directly from Valente's website, Canadian Payments Modernization Utilizing Links. We heard it here in this video clip. Uh, and of course, Valente Volpe for Ripple. We know Valente Technology does run the Volpe Ripple processor module, speeding up integration to the Ripple Global Settlement Network. So, uh, you know, this has been obviously news that we've been talking about for a while now. And guys, things are only going to speed up. Another clip here from Mr. Mann, November 2025 marks the full implementation for Canada's Lynx system. Listen to this clip from the same interview. Taking into account then the implementation of ISO 2022, What's next then for Lynx? So what we're looking at from this point forward, um, we've defined a coexistence period, uh, which will take us until November of 2025. So we continue to support the legacy uh, messages that we've introduced as part of release one uh, for Lynx, the Swift MT messages. And with ISO 2022, uh, we're providing flexibility for our, our financial institutions to migrate over time. Uh, we're really pleased uh, that uh, following the implementation of release two, uh, roughly about 50% of the payments are being settled using ISO 2022 messages. Um, so we'll continue to support the community and our financial institutions through the coexistence period as they move uh, and migrate more uh, payment traffic as they look to introduce uh, more capabilities and support for their customers over the coming years uh, and really work very closely to plan for the end of coexistence. Uh, so working in lockstep uh, with what SWIFT has communicated to the broader industry from a global community uh, for the end of uh, November 2025, for the end of the coexistence, uh, that really will be a large focus for us over the coming years, uh, looking to plan for the um, enhancements and changes that come along with that and support the industry throughout that period. So November 2025, uh, that will be the full implementation for Canada's Link system, which is running on Valente Technologies. Uh, know what you hold here posting this, uh, an interesting observation, ties with the BIS, the IMF, and the WEF backend settlements for 2025. Retail CBDCs will be here post 2025, backend first, then consumer. So we know about this information, right? The BIS, the IMF, the WEF, all talking about backend settlements and uh, all projecting that 2025 roadmap uh, for the full implementation of a new banking system. Uh, and Canada is also on the same page with that. November 2025 uh, is Canada's date, Canada's drop dead date for the Link system being fully integrated on the Link system, which we know is uh, part of Valente Technologies, which runs the Ripple processor module. So $4.6 billion daily today or at least in 2022, it's probably going to be more in 2023. Guys, we're seeing it ramp up. And this one from Weezy at Nerd Nation Unbox. John Deaton, did you ever think you would hear Peter Vanderberg say, it'll be harder to classify Ripple or Stellar as a security 
than Ethereum. Now, to give you guys some context here, uh, Peter is the director of research at Coin Center and has been since October of 2014. Here is a presentation uh, from 2016. Okay, so this is from a while ago. But if you listen to this interview, you got to hear what he says about Ripple and Stellar vis-a-vis -vis Ethereum. Listen to this. So I, I would argue that it's harder to make the case that Ripple or Stellar actually fit easily into the definition of securities because you were still working with a distributed network that's effectively open. What about Ether? So for the second, for the second so Ether's pre-sale is alarming. Um, and you have to ask yourself, how diverse is the development and the mining community in Ether? One yep. Another option here uh, that would potentially be an avenue would be to classify the Ether presale token as a security because it was used as a speculative investment to finance investment, uh, finance development of the, of the code base rather, and then to classify Ether, the token that people ended up getting uh, in reward for their contribution to the presale as not a security. So I don't know about you, but I think that sums up a lot. Again, this was back from 2016 when the fundamentals were a lot clearer with regards to Ethereum. I think, uh, you know, fast forward six, seven years in the future and the people associated with Ethereum, the Ethereum Alliance, uh, you know, maybe even the SEC to a degree, they are turning a blind eye to how Ethereum got started. Of course, we know why Ripple and XRP are being thrown under the bus by Gary Gensler and the SEC, but it is getting more and more difficult to prove that some of these cryptocurrencies are in fact securities. When you just look at the fundamentals, you look at the history, and I mean, I gotta say, if it weren't for the internet, if it weren't for uh, you know people posting clips and tweets and research, we would not be able to prove this in the court of Twitter. I just hope the lawyers on the respective sides of these cases are paying close, close attention. I have a feeling Ripple's lawyers are, but that's just my opinion. I wanna hear what you guys think. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Like the video if you like the content I'm providing. I always love hearing your comments. See you in the next one, guys.